Hello, I'm um, not uh, not officially starting yet, but wanted to kind of get the broadcast going and make sure everything is uh, running smoothly. So um, hello to people who are here. I see we got a bunch of people, uh, a bunch of people here waiting, which is great. I'm going to get underway in a few minutes, but I just want to, again, be making sure that things are good. So are they good? They look good. Yeah, but wanted to come. They sound good. All right. So, <laughs> so there's me. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, I, I uh, put a, a, a little note at the top of the chat. Um, again, I'm going to be taking questions, whatever questions you all have, I'm really happy to to be answering. So uh, obviously, I'm here mostly to talk about my uh, Harmony course that I've just launched and uh, help you uh, decide if it's for you. And, and part of what I'm going to do is teach you some of the information from it. So you'll you'll see if it's for you and you'll see it uh, being taught live in real time. And I'll give you a little tour of the course. So if you have questions about any of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, or if you have questions about, you know, logistics of the course or anything else really about music, you all probably know I'm one of the developers of MuseScore. So um, maybe you've got MuseScore questions and I can get to those as there's time also. And um, yeah, just so feel free to pop into the chat and uh, let me know, uh, let me know what you're most interested in and I can try to talk about that. So uh we're getting close to the official start time. Uh, <laughs> I'm. Uh, oh, there I am. Okay, I was. I'm. I'm also checking on my phone just to make sure everything is fine. And uh, for whatever reason, my phone wasn't uh, updating. To pop into the chat, and... but now it is. So I'm happy. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, one of the things in the course is I definitely take an approach that is broader than most in that I cover concepts from classical harmony and jazz harmony and really try to show the, the commonalities and similarities. Um, so I see uh, Benedict is uh, saying he's interested in jazz harmony for arranging, and I'll talk a little bit about that today and show uh, some of the, the lessons that maybe are the most interesting and appropriate for that. Uh, and again, I would uh, encourage anyone else who is who is here uh, wanting to uh, learn more to just introduce yourself. You know, type in a little, "Hey, my name's so and so, and this is what I'm most interested in." And uh, uh, I can be sure to make this the most useful I can to the most people. So we're almost at the start time. <clears throat> <clears throat> Clive, oh yes, and that is a good thing to, for me to remember, and I do remember, Clive, that uh, um, when uh, when the U.S. clocks change, uh, GMT stays GMT, so uh, <clears throat> when the U.S. time changes, 12.30 Eastern will become 17.30, and I think that happens like in about a month. So uh, so here's a MuseScore question from someone. Can you upload, uh, download the 3.5 update on top of 3.1? Well, you don't have to uninstall it first, but um, uh, when you install 3.5, it will replace 3.1 for you. I will say 3.5.2 is coming out, I think, today. If it didn't already, I haven't checked. I've been uh, busy teaching. <laughs> um, but... Uh, 3.5.2 fixes some bugs and stuff. So uh, if you don't see that it says 3.5.2 yet, I would just say hold off for a second. Okay, <clears throat> so we are uh, we are past uh, 10.30, so I'd like to officially start. Uh, my name is Mark Sabatella, and I'd like to thank all of you who are here. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Mark Sabatella, again, the director of the Mastering MuseScore School, one of the directors, uh, one of the uh, developers of MuseScore. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about music, which is the thing that if you use MuseScore, what you use it for. So... Um, what I want to do is talk about harmony. I want to talk about my approach to harmony, how I teach harmony, 
teach a little bit of it to you and show you how you can learn more about it through my course. That's the, that is the goal here. So I'm seeing, okay, so one person is specifically talking about uh, jazz arranging and one person is specifically talking about uh, classical playing. And this is, this is great to me that we have both of these things coming in here uh, because that is my background also. I mean, I took classical piano lessons for years uh, and studied classical theory and then I became, well, I didn't like magically become a jazz pianist, but I became interested in jazz and started getting into jazz improvisation and then jazz composition and arranging. And they, they were like two separate sides of my world for a while. Oh, what, here's what I knew about uh, um, classical music and here's what I knew about jazz. And I there, there's some commonalities in there, but I wasn't necessarily making the connections at first. Oh, and by the way, I, you know, I grew up in the 70s. I was into Billy Joel. I was into Barry Manilow. I mean, I, I was into a lot lot of 70s uh, singers and songwriters and uh, <clears throat> learned how to play their music on the piano by ear because uh, I would get the sheet music and say, you know what, that sheet music isn't right, right? It, it's, it's like some arranger's version of how these songs should go. And I knew from the radio how they should go. And so I would improve them based on what my ear was telling me. But then I also had this classical knowledge and I had this jazz knowledge and they're all swimming around in my head. And at some point, things just started clicking. That's the best I can say. Uh, there's a lot of a lot to the story of how they really came to click for me. And maybe as we go on, I'll tell more about that story. But uh, at some point, the light bulbs went off for me, and I started seeing really how to connect all of these things. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's what I want to talk about. So. Uh, first thing I want to do is just sort of browse through what's in the course, and we're going to pick a lesson, and I'm going to sort of talk through the lesson. Uh, I'll show you how it works in the course, but then I'm just going to give you the lesson myself live so you can be asking me questions. So once you're logged into the course, oh, and uh, I say the course. Let me make sure I have the link in here, right? Um, to learn more or enroll, visit. And then I go to where I actually have the course. And so those of you who are uh, subscribers have already seen the link with the discount uh, applied. And those of you who uh, maybe are just finding out about this webinar from Facebook or, or uh, Twitter or elsewhere, you might not know uh, about the discount that I'm offering, but uh, basically through Friday uh, is uh, um, this. There is a twenty dollar off discount that is applied when you use this link. So anyhow, I'm trying not to be too much of a commercial here, but you know. Okay, so a new keyboard called an arranger, and it requires left hand chords in root position. Ah, interesting. So yeah, that would be tricky. And hi, Gail. It's good to good to see you here. Um, if you're really used to having played chords in a particular way through jazz training, it can be really hard to kind of unlearn that and play chords simply. And part of what I teach in this course is how to play them more interestingly, although it's not specifically for piano, but I do cover that topic. Um, so uh, unlearning that and going back to just playing boring root position chords is uh, is going is I'm sure a challenge. So in the course, once you're once you're there, you will see this long list of all the different lessons, and the lessons have like you know timings on them, so you know how long the videos that go with them. And since a couple people have specifically mentioned jazz, I'm going to jump to a jazz uh, lesson here and talk about it briefly, and then I'll uh, jump around from there. So. Um, when you do, when you click on a lesson, uh, you'll see the video for the lesson, and if there's any handout that goes with it, which there are for most of them, that'll be below. And then to the left is just the the, the list of things again. So I want to talk through this thing about. Uh, jazz voicings. I present this information in the video as it applies to piano, but it absolutely applies to arranging and not just for jazz. And this is the comment, the point I want to make over and over again. There is no such thing as jazz theory, jazz harmony, classical theory, classical harmony. It's all the same stuff. Yeah, there's different flavors, different approaches, different little tweaks that people might take to things, but we're really talking about the same things. So um, if I want to, and so I realize 
uh, I'm going to do some stuff at the piano and I realize you won't really be able to see the keys and stuff. And that's, you know, that's okay. Um, but one of the basic principles of playing chords in a style that comes from jazz, it comes from jazz by way though of people like Debussy and then, well, really Chopin and then Debussy and then maybe George Gershwin. There's a whole tradition of late romantic era uh, and then early modern 20th century composers who hit on these, this style of playing chords that then jazz musicians really got into. And my best way that I can explain uh, the overall concept here is the root is an important note, but it's not necessarily the pianist's job. And this is, I think, what Gail is referring to. Um, so if I want to play, say, a C chord, I want to play a C and I'm going to play it down in the bass range of the piano. Or if I'm arranging, I'm going to give that to, you know, bass trombone, baritone saxophone, the bass player in the ensemble. Um, or in an orchestra, I will give it to cellos and contrabasses and tubas and bassoons. I will give the root down in the bass to these instruments very often. And then above that is where things get interesting. Instead of just thinking about triads, root, third, fifth, we think about, first of all, we think about the fifth as being optional. The fifth is a note that, yeah, if there's time, we're going to get to it. If we got enough fingers left over, if we got an instrument's left over, and we're not too cluttered already with all the other stuff we might add, uh, we can play a fifth. But fifths are, generally speaking, not going to be all that important. Instead, we're going to focus on the third of the chord and the seventh of the chord. So one of the hallmarks of jazz harmony specifically is that we're always going to put sevenths on chords, practically always. And again, this isn't unique to jazz, but it's something that jazz musicians sort of take for granted. Uh, and again, this comes from people like uh, uh, Chopin, maybe not so much. He definitely had a lot of triads going, but by the time you get to Debussy, triads really aren't the thing necessarily. It really does become much more about the extensions on the chords. So after the root, I want the third and I want the seventh. And let's say if we're playing in the key of C, and I'm going to talk about the key of C because it's really easy to demonstrate things in the key of C. Uh, by default, we're going to expect the sevenths that we add to chords if they're not already like specified in the music somehow to be diatonic. So for C, I'm going to expect a C with a major seventh, the B, by default. Um, and so if I'm playing a song in the key of C, um, right, I'm going to play it with a major seventh. That's still just playing it in root position. But the third and the seventh are going to be the really important notes that I want. Jazz pianists refer to this as a shell. So if I play my root, then my third and seventh, and then if I have fingers or instruments left over is when I add the color to that. And the color to that is going to be sixths and ninths mostly. In other words, it's going to be notes that are not the root, third, fifth, or the seventh. And so if I've got a root, a third, and a seventh, I could add on top of that either a ninth, which is a D, or a sixth which is A. And these are the notes, and I can add them both. That then becomes this really basic fundamental sound of jazz arranging, where or jazz piano playing. You have a root on the bottom, you have thirds and sevenths in the middle, color tones on top. The color tones on top, well, we can tuck one of them in between the third and seventh if we want, but we usually try to get one of the color tones on top. So that kind of sound. So we have root on the bottom, third and seventh in the middle, color tones above that, but maybe overlapping the thirds and sevenths. But either the third or seventh should be at the bottom of that shape, other than the roots. So we have the root, then we have either a third or a seventh, and then we can maybe throw in a color tone, and then we're going to have the other note, either the third or the seventh, and then we can have more color tones if we want. This basic principle underlies 
everything about how jazz pianists, jazz guitar players, or jazz arrangers conceptualize harmony and represent it. So this topic is one that I have this whole lesson here about uh, with a, a, a handout that goes in, into some depth on it and then a video in which I talk about it at some, in some depth and, and go through this sort of step by step in, in more detail than what I just did there. Um, and I call that one a bonus lesson because I'm realizing that, you know, not everyone who actually my microphone isn't facing me. Here we go. Um, uh, not everyone who's in who is taking the course is going to be that interested in that much intricacy of jazz voicing specifically. But I want to, and I and I make that comment right at the top of the lesson. Uh, I say, uh, this lesson gets really deep into the jazz language, could be an entire course or more on its own, which is absolutely true. And someday it will be. <laughs> uh, so don't worry if it seems overwhelming right now, but I do encourage you to check out the video to get an idea of what's possible. So even if your background is more in rock and classical and that's where you see yourself being, I'm saying that these sounds are beautiful sounds to bring into music just like Debussy did, just like George Gershwin did. Of course, George Gershwin is someone who I think... I think jazz musicians think of him as a classical musician. Classical musicians think of him as a jazz musician. That, that is my overall uh, perception of how people think of George Gershwin. To me, he is a musician who is someone who really nicely bridged the gap in the really early days of jazz, before jazz was even anything resembling what it is now. He, he actually had a pretty good understanding of, of maybe where it was going. So... Um, <coughs> Anyhow, that is a is a lesson that you'll find really interesting if you're interested in jazz harmony specifically. And then if you're not interested in jazz harmony specifically, I still encourage you to check it out and see which of those sounds you feel like you could use in your own music. But then the other question came in about uh, improving playing of classical music by having a better understanding of structure. And this to me is a really insightful question. So uh, I thank you, uh, Larry, for uh, for bringing this up. Um, there are so many ways that even when playing fully notated music, and so you're not necessarily creating uh, new harmonies of your own, you're expressing what's already written for you by Beethoven or whoever, um, understanding the harmony is just incredibly powerful and useful. So I'm actually going to fire up uh, MuseScore here and bring in uh, a score. Uh, guess I will use this Mozart one. No, I, I okay, I'm going to use this Schubert piece here. And there's method to my madness here. Um, so this Schubert piece, uh, let me play a little bit of it for you. So this is Allegretto in C minor of Schubert. This comes from, by the way, the Open Score Project, which is a, uh, it's a, it's sort of the musical equivalent of what MuseScore is for software. MuseScore is free and open source software for uh, you know creating sheet music. Um, open Score is a set of scores like this that were created using MuseScore that are similarly free and open source. Meaning, you know, you don't have to buy this sheet music, and it's it's uh, freely available and professionally uh, are. A, professionally put together. I actually got rid of uh, some of the stuff. There, there, there were all sorts of dynamic markings and other things in here that I actually got rid of because it makes the analysis uh, a little cleaner. But the original version of this uh, looks very professional with dynamic markings and all, all, everything else you would expect to see. And it's all available on MuseScore.com and you can just download them for free and use them. It's meant to be an, edu uh, an educational resource for the world to have this uh, repository of professionally done editions of classical music. So I'm using it a lot in the examples that I do. And I use this piece 
uh, I want to say I, I, I can't remember if I ended up using this one or not as one of my examples, but I definitely was intending to use it. So uh, I haven't ever played this on the piano before. I've never played it. I'm going to play it one more time with my eyes closed. So if you wanted to learn that piece on the piano <clears throat> and then memorize it, if you think about this, I'm going to give you a, a, a set of letters to remember. Okay? You ready? Here it goes. M-L-P-N-K-O-B-J-I-V-H-U-C-G-Y-F. Uh, no, X, F, T, Z, D, R, S, E, A, W, Q. All right. Can you all um, type that back for me? Can you all uh, like say, okay, I memorized that sequence. It's 26 letters. I'm going to guess that no one is going to even be able to come close to remembering that sequence. However, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. I will bet you can all memorize that one really easily. In fact, even if I vary it and say B, A, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, and, and all I did was change the first letter, right? Or I say it backwards, Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, A, A, I used to be able to say that really fast. Um, the, the point is, if something ends up being a recognizable pattern, then that in itself makes it uh, more playable. It makes it easier to remember. It makes it easier to deal with at really just about any level that you want to uh, that you want to deal with this piece. It's going to be easy easier if it's something where you recognize the patterns. So I said I've never played that thing on the piano before, uh, but. Oh, it was an octave, right? I'm pretty sure it started off that way. And uh, that is because I recognized the pattern was a C minor triad that was being arpeggiated. I think it's that. You know, did I get some little tiny detail of it wrong? No. Yeah. And then I, I so that I totally have that right. And then something very similar to that. Da, 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 exactly that. There you go. So I managed to memorize that piece despite never having played it because I recognize those patterns. And I'm not claiming that that is some unique skill that I have that no one else has. I am saying that understanding the structure of the piece makes that kind of process go much more quickly. Oh, and then the next phrase. Uh, see, I don't remember that. Ah. I think it went like that. And what happened there, the reason I remembered exactly what these notes are is, is I very clearly became aware as I was listening to this, that that was a minor four chord. Minor four chords are a beautiful, beautiful thing. Oh, when I say minor four chord, it was the minor four chord in the key of E flat. Right at that point, it's no longer in C minor, it's in E flat major. So at that point, it's in E flat major. Well, recognizing that is part of the whole pattern recognition as well. And then recognizing that this was a one chord, Minor four, back to one. Now I need to check and see how close I came. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then there was... Or something like that. I didn't pay enough attention to remember exactly how that line went. But if I listened to it one more time, watched it on, you know, looked at the sheet music one more time, I'd be, I'd be good with it. So... Um, being able to recognize patterns is what makes the memorization of it go much more smoothly. 
but it's not just about memorization either. And yeah, Larry, this is this is this this is important stuff for sure. Uh, so being able to memorize that that minor four chord, by the way, I have to <laughs> I, I have to say is if you you could do a, a if you do like a web search and look for something that says something like most important note or most important chord, you, you might think that that's a silly question to ask. There's no there's no most important note. There's no most important chord. And yet, you will find any number of people writing blog articles, publishing videos, and doing whatnot, telling you about that minor four chord, and in particular, about that note right there, the uh, C flat. So that we have scale degree five, E flat, the key of E flat, one, three, five, one, three, five, and then it goes up to flat six and down to five. That note right there, scale degree flat six. If there was one note that was more important than any other note in the entire chromatic scale to really add color and power and harmonic depth to your music, that note is it. Um, and I, yeah, I make that point in a number of places throughout the course, as do any number of other people. And you might think that's a really silly claim to make, and that it would be impossible to really support a claim like that. But I'm, no, <laughs> there really is some truth to it. And yeah, it is, it is totally exaggerated what I'm saying. You can't really say one note is the most important note, but it kind of is. Um, and it's because of that amazingly beautiful color that it provides, being able to have that minor four chord. What we'll also learn is you can add that note to the five chord also. The five chord, B flat seven, we can add that same note, C flat, and get a really lovely sound. In fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take Schubert and give him a little bit of that sound. I'm going to take that. So let me play this measure right here. Let me play it again. And this time, I'm just going to do one little change, and that is add a C flat. Um, so it just added that little bit of extra color in there. I could uh, slow it down, actually, and make it that much easier, but uh, I don't know that that adds any any real value right now, so I'm not going to do that at this moment here. But um, uh, that idea that you can take that same note, that note that was scale degree flat six, and use it to give yourself a minor four chord, or use it to add color to your five chord, is a really powerful device to know as a composer or arranger. But also it means you can stop being surprised when you see that note show up in your music and in, in like a classical piece that you're trying to learn and think, oh my gosh, how am I gonna remember that this C flat happens here? It happens because it happens, it's a thing. It, it's a real thing that happens all the time in music that incorporate, oh, Okay, I keep uh, I keep moving the camera so that you can see my hands, and then I'm not uh, at face level anymore. So um, the idea that uh, that note is something that can be incorporated into the four chord, and we think of that four to one as a plagal cadence. Well, this is called a minor plagal cadence, but that same note can be added to the five chord so that instead of the usual authentic cadence. We have this other version of an authentic cadence that's five to one, but with that note. Where does that flat six come from? It doesn't belong in the key of E flat major, but it does come from E flat minor. This is called a borrowed chord, and I have a whole, I got like three or four lessons actually just on not that note, but the whole idea of borrowing chords. The idea that you could be in a major key and hear one note from the minor key that you really want to use. So E flat major doesn't have a C flat in it. It has a C natural. It has a C natural, but but E flat minor does have that C flat. But then C minor, I mean E flat minor has a D flat 
It has a, a flatted seventh scale degree, but if you know the harmonic minor scale, you already know minor scales like to borrow that note from the major key. So minor keys like to borrow some notes from major keys, and major keys like to borrow some notes from minor keys. And the more you're aware of when this is happening, the less surprised you are when you see things like this happening. Uh, I guess the piece ends, yeah, here's the ending of the piece. Let's hear the end. So it's very C minor, but, and, and that C minor means we have B flat and A flat here, B flat and A flat, but then you notice we get a B natural later. And how and where he chooses to use the B natural. Uh, if you know harmonic minor as a concept, well, that is where the B natural comes from. But it's not like he's saying, oh, I'm going to use natural minor here, harmonic minor there. We don't, composers don't really think about scales in that way. They think of it as we're in the key of C minor and it has both a B natural and a B flat. It has a B flat that sort of occurs naturally, but it has a B natural that we can borrow from the major key whenever we want. When do we want? Well, we want it when we're approaching a cadence. We want this B natural when we're going from to that. We basically are going from a G chord, a five chord, to a one chord. That is the specific situation where we borrow that B natural. So this is all part of that patterning I'm talking about. Knowing in advance that that's the case, that there's going to be that B natural there, and there probably won't be a B natural in these other places where we're not approaching a cadence point. Uh, knowing what a cadence point is, is a whole other topic and a whole other series of lessons in the course. But um, so knowing where to expect there to be the B-flats, where to expect there to be the B-naturals, and to recognize that based on what's going on, you can hear the difference. That line. Oh. Nope. Sorry, I'm trying to read and play sideways. But uh, if I went... If I had the B natural in there, it would have a very different sound. Knowing the sound of that seventh, the major seventh versus the minor seventh scale degree, knowing the sound of B natural versus B flat in the key of C minor, that's an important thing to know the difference in that sound. And you'll know the difference in the sound not because, oh, B flat sounds like this and B natural sounds like that. No, it's not about B flat sounding different than B natural. It's about scale degree flat seven versus scale degree seven in the key of C minor. Um, because then the same thing will, uh, uh, if I want to do that same thing in A minor. Yeah. So versus, which is what the other one would have been. So. Learning these patterns is what enables you to recognize what's going on, to, to make that connection between what you're hearing and why it's there, which then makes, again, the memorization go easier because now you just know, oh, it's a B flat there, it's a B natural there, because I know that's what it sounds like. But more than that, I wanted to come back to a point I started to make. Knowing that that minor four chord is there for a very specific purpose to create a particular type of tension that then gets released. Uh, oh, fool on the hill. Um, I probably could. Let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that actually modulates minor. So that, that's like a different thing to talk about. So I think I would, uh, I, I will, I will put that off and uh, maybe come back to it. But uh, it's it ends up being a uh, a slightly different uh, tack. But my point that I'm making here is that the power of that minor four chord is immense. It really is. And as a player, okay, someone might say 
that this piece was meant to be played in a perhaps more early classical type of vibe, less romantic type of vibe. I mean, based on where Schubert exists in history, he, it could go either way, right? But I want to say, if you want to push this in the romantic direction without doing like I did, actually adding a new note, let me get rid of that note, um, you could draw out that chord a little more. By hanging on that chord, just that extra little moment, if if you've decided that, you know, you want to do that sort of push and pull with tempo on here, you want to push it in that romantic direction, that's the chord you do it on. And you do it, maybe your ear tells you that already. Hey, that chord feels important. It feels significant. It feels like maybe I want to dwell on it. But maybe it just doesn't occur to you. Maybe it doesn't because you're not really cognizant of what's going on. But once you realize the power of that minor four chord there, that A flat minor chord, all time favorite example of that minor four chord. That minor four chord is just such an amazing chord and it's just hard not to uh, fall in love with that chord. So I need to play you uh, this little section of Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto. Uh, um, it's the concerto number two in C minor, but at this point we are in C major. Here it comes. I mean, that just like <laughs> brings me to tears just even thinking about that. I mean, that's the computer playing it back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting so emotional. Boy, I don't know where that's coming from. But that minor four chord just breaks you up when it's played, really. I mean, if you hear this piece performed live and you hear someone really getting into how that chord sounds there, we're in the key of E and that A minor chord when it shows up. This is, it also became a 70s pop song, which is how I first learned the thing. But I mean, my God, it is such a powerful chord. And in a good performance of this, they are going to ring every possible bit of no, oh my gosh, ah! Okay, lost picture, let me see if I can get it back real quick. All right, do we have picture back is the question. Well, that's disappointing. Okay, so it looks like I have the picture back. The question is, do we have sound? So I'm gonna play here again. So, ah, uh, better? So hopefully uh, that played back. Yeah, yeah, you were looking at my uh, broadcasting software is what you were looking at. That's why you saw that kaleidoscope effect. You were seeing the broadcast of my picture and it became a picture and a picture and a picture and a picture. So yeah, that 
passage there and the way that that chord works there when we go from one chord and then we have the secondary two five into the two chord which is beautiful in itself and the way he uses inversions there and i talk about that in the course how secondary two fives work and how that use of that inversion works and i go through this exact example while talking about that minor four chord that shows up right there. And that's the one that I'm saying, I mean, the whole piece is just incredibly gorgeous, but that one chord is my very favorite example of that chord. Now, you want some pop examples? Sure, I can give you some pop examples. So, one, minor four, minor four, one and then uh, right there minor four so there's an example right there of a minor four chord billy joel because i mentioned billy joel uh so that's just the way you are that minor four chord is all over that song um and yeah, there's all sorts of other examples. Um, so I uh, mentioned the Beatles scale. Uh, so I, I'm for Fool on the Hill. It's more about this modulation is what I'm hearing. And so but but I could talk about. Uh, then the bridge. Secondary dominant. Four chord, then minor four chord, back to one. So yeah, that minor four chord is actually all over popular music as well. So uh, hey, Ron, good to good to have you here as well. And um, yeah, so that minor four chord is really powerful. Oh, and I think I use actually in the course in my life if I'm remembering correctly, as an example. Maybe not, maybe I didn't. I, I think I, I've used it as an example before, but, uh, you know, uh, put it up, you know. Um, faces I remember. In my life, I love you. And boy, when I talk about hanging on that minor four chord. That is what John Lennon does at the very end of that song. It's this beautiful. Well, it's more beautiful when John sings it. <laughs> but it's it's that minor four chord just being strummed and put out there. The rhythm stops and John sings that. I love you more. And then, you know, then the final bit of the coda happens. So yeah, that chord is super powerful. And that's why there is, there's not a whole section of the course just on that chord, but there's a whole section of the course on the idea of borrowing chords, that when you're in a major key, you might borrow that chord. And so there's minor four chord. There's other chords we might borrow. We can also borrow flat seven chords and flat three chords. And we can talk about these other chords that get borrowed. Um, and, and in minor keys, again, that leading tone is really borrowed from the major key. So in a minor key, anytime you have a major, in a minor key, anytime we have five going to one. Um, so uh, yes, of course, it's all applicable. Every single chord I just talked about exists on guitar also. So um, yeah, uh, on guitar, it's just, I'm not demonstrating on the guitar here because I don't have one in front of me and I don't play the guitar, but uh, I know how, you know, I know what how the notes are tuned and, you know, I can eventually figure out any given chord. But it's still the case that if you are looking to create some good music, then learning how to use, for instance, that five chord, uh, that, that minor four chord, or how to learn how to do these things, these secondary dominants, like when I talked about the the bridge in uh, uh, If I Fell, that one. So, um, this chord here that I'm calling a secondary dominant, C7, 
going to F. C7 doesn't belong in the key of C, but it does belong in the key of F. We're temporarily going to F. That remains true whether you're playing that song on the piano or playing it on the guitar. And so if you're writing a song, whether you're writing it on the piano or writing it on guitar, you want to know how to do that. You want to know how to use a C7 chord to get to F. Even though you're in the key of C and you might not think C7 belongs in the key of C, it does. In fact, even if you're trying to get to an F chord in some other key, you might be playing a song in the key of D or a song in the key of A, and somewhere you want an F chord, I'm telling you, C7 is what's going to get you there. Um, and that's called a secondary dominant. And that's another one of the really important principles that I, that I cover. And so, and it's just as applicable in your playing. And, uh, you know, you could be playing your chords, D chord, and then you come to that G minor chord and you just strum and let it hang there for a little minute because it's such a powerful chord. And then you resume your strumming. I mean, you don't have to do that, but I'm telling you that understanding the immense power of individual chords and knowing, hey, this one is really powerful. I want to hang here. Or this chord is really just there to get me to the next chord. So let me play that one a little thinner and play, you know, maybe a little more quickly, maybe with fewer notes, maybe, you know, not dwell on it as much so that I can focus more on this other chord. And the other thing is this is applicable whether we're talking about um, you know, I'm demonstrating on piano, but by gosh, I've been talking about Rachmaninoff here. The, yes, this is a piano concerto, but all the piano is doing is playing the melody, right? I mean, the melody is... It's... I'm doing that with one finger. Uh, ding, 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 ding. This is not virtuoso piano. Pl I mean, the rest of the concerto, yeah. <laughs> but that little passage does not require great piano skills, nor is the harmony actually there. The harmony isn't even apparent in the piano part here. The harmony, that beautiful minor four chord, when it happens, is in the strings. So it, the A minor, the power of that chord is about the C natural, and that C natural is here in uh, one of the cello parts, and it's here, wait a minute, in the viola part, what, what clef, I mean, alto clef at that point. Um, so uh, C, the, there's a, a C here, in the violins, you know, after so there's C's buried in places, and I think in the winds also. Uh, yeah, this is a clarinet part, but we're not in, we're in transposed, and so it's looking like an E flat because it's an A clarinet at that point. So the point is that we're arranging this thing for a whole orchestra, but the same concept is applying, whether, whether we're talking about uh, playing a pop song on the piano or arranging uh, Rachmaninoff for orchestra or playing whatever you might be playing on guitar, the language is the same. The language used by Schubert in that one piece with the minor four chord that used by Rachmaninoff in his string parts here, used by Billy Joel there, used by John Lennon in In My Life, it's all the same language, I promise. Um, and so learning what these sounds are and how they work. Um, all the different, my picture's black, my gosh. Um, pic, oh, picture's back, okay, yes, good, all right, good. I thought you said I was black, um, I mean the picture. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry if there's like little technical glitches on here. I guess that is the, the reality of live teaching is that sometimes things go off a little bit technically. The nice thing about the online course is everything is pre-recorded. If something doesn't go right, I just re-record it and it's up there. So there's like, there are, I want to say like 12 or, well, there's more than 12 hours worth of, of pre-recorded video up there. And most of them are in little sections. So, you know, thanks for giving me the excuse to just pop back over here. Um, like, that lesson in which I talk about the minor four chord. I've been going on and on and on about this, but really it's this one uh, video here, use in major keys, borrowed chords, use in major keys. So I guess I go on for a while about it in there too. Um, but there are these individual little lessons uh, talking about very specific things. And I really focus on that chord and other chords, like there's that flat nine, borrowing that same scale degree, but putting it on the five chord, because this example is in C. Um, Anyhow, so in the, in the course, I really break down 
uh, a lot of this stuff into little digestible pieces. Most of these videos covering the individual topics are on the order of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so here's one that's six or seven, 13, 17, seven. But then at the end of every section is a, uh, um, a demonstration in which I go into depth. So in this particular uh, demonstration, I actually go through, Mary had a little lamb because, okay, here's the other thing. <laughs> um, most of my demonstrations are songs like that. And you might think that that's like a weird and silly choice but it's not. Okay, there's a number of reasons for it. One is they're songs that are relatively familiar to most people, regardless of your sort of genre of choice. You know, if you mostly identify as a, a classical musician and that's what you listen to most, or mostly listen to rock music or mostly listen to jazz or whatever, um, chances are you're fairly familiar with the songs that I use as examples. They also happen to be uh, ones that I can use copyright free because they're all, you know, well over 100 years old. Not all of them. I do have some examples that are more recent, um, but smaller excerpts. But for like Mary Had a Little Lamb, I go through the entire piece um, and uh, go through it and add harmonization to it. And maybe you've seen one of the little promo videos maybe that where I've, I've used it. Um, and I go through and I talk about all these different ways of using these same chords. And so this was a demonstration in which I managed to use uh, that minor four chord, right? Minor four chord, and then. So in this demonstration, I basically talk through uh, over the course of whatever it is, uh, 20 something minutes, no, 20, almost, almost 30 minutes on this, where I take that song from just a melody and really simple chords, one and five, and I talk about how I employ these topics. Okay, let's take this chord and let's harmonize this one using a secondary dominant like I do here. Uh, see, bum, 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 and then... Uh, there's a secondary dominant because that's five. A7 is the five of D minor. And so secondary dominants are a thing I've alluded to here. And in the course, I talk about them at huge length. I've just been on this minor four chord kick for the, for the past 20 minutes or whatever it's been. But um, in any case, I really talk about how I take this melody and harmonize it, not just using the basic one and five triads, which is fine. Some songs just want that, but I want to show you how to do more if you want. Then you decide when you want, right? Or if you're talking about, uh, as I think Larry was, I want to take a classical piece and just improve my playing of it by understanding its structure. Well, if you're given a piece that already has all those complex harmonies by understanding what's going on, why they were added by the composer, how they're functioning, it becomes that much easier to play them with the proper expression and to memorize it because you you understand the structure of it. So yeah, I go through and over the course of, of a half hour, I reharmonize this whole piece, talking about every single chord as I go. And pretty much every section of the course is like that. I mean, for borrowed, that was the borrowed chord section, but then the secondary dominant section. Similarly, I've got like a handful of 15 minute lessons where I break down individual aspects of it. And then I go through an example in which I show, in this case, it's Danny Boy, in which I go through with secondary dominance. And then. So I just added secondary dominance right now in that second measure there. So instead of just going, instead of just going straight to the four chord, I said, well, what if that four chord wanted to be tonic for the day? You know, what if we wanted to make that four chord, that A flat chord, feel more important? Well, the way I did it was I gave that four chord its only, I gave it its own two five. So if I wanted to pretend I was in the key of A flat, I can give it a two and a five going to one. So, and then my two, and there's that major seven that I mentioned also. And then, and then here's that two, five, going to A flat. That 
type of thing is a huge hugely important in all genres of music. I mean, going back to the Baroque and earlier, this idea that you might give certain chords extra import, importance by giving them their own five chords or their own two fives. Bach loved to do that. And I show a Bach example of this as well. But then I go through taking some well-known tune and showing how I'm going to apply this. And so that you then can be able to do the same. So um, thanks. And I really appreciate all the comments coming in here about this. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I just love this material. I love it's a cliche to say you love music, right? We wouldn't be here if we love music, if we didn't love music. But, you know, if I want to say I love music, I'm your, this is what's really speaking from the heart now. <laughs> That's why I practically broke down in tears just listening to computer playback of that Rachmaninoff piece. It's so incredibly beautiful to me, the way these chords work together, the way these harmonies work. And that is what I am wanting to be, um, I don't know, instilling in you is an appreciation for what these sounds are so that whether you're composing your own music or maybe arranging music for some other ensemble and maybe doing some reharmonization while you're at it or just taking existing music and wanting to appreciate it that much more to enhance your performance of it, as uh, Larry was talking about understanding these concepts of harmony is what enables all that and uh, would I have been reduced practically to tears by hearing that one chord in the Rachmaninoff if I didn't know what it was? Well, maybe. I mean, it's designed to elicit an emotional reaction, whether you understand the source of it or not. Um, understanding the source of that in no way diminishes the power, the emotional power of it. In some ways, it gives you an added appreciation for it, because now you can appreciate the subtleties of how they're using that powerful thing. Um, but uh, I don't know. For me, learning the structure of things just increases my appreciation. So uh, the question about uh, the, the computer being a long way from the piano, yeah, you, you don't need to have the piano with you while you're working through the course. Um, now, for that matter, you can work through the course. I would recommend being at the computer to work through it so you can see it on a big screen, but you can access it on a cell phone also. So, you know, you could just, you know, pull up little bits of it to crib off of um, that way. Also, um, below each video, well, not, not the demo, uh, let me pick one of the uh, other ones. So this video where I'm talking about those borrowed chords and those minor four chords, then there's a handout right below it. And this handout, if I click on it, uh, well, first of all, I can just view it here on this website. But if I click on this, it's going to take me over to musecore.com. And on your cell phone, it'll actually open it up in a nice little sort of app in which you can then read that handout and play the examples. So this is, you're looking at, this isn't MuseCorp, right? This is Chrome you're looking at. This is a web page on Chrome, but you can play these examples. So all the handouts have that sort of interactive quality. We're like, oh, I wonder what this example over here sounds like. That's what that example sounds like. And so, you know, you, there's the text that goes with it. There's the example. And that will all work on your phone. So it's possible to access that level of it. And you can certainly watch the videos on your phone also. So, um, so those are uh, things you can do. So as for homework assignments, yes, one of the things that I've done is like, let me show you that demonstration again. Which one is this? This is the bar. The Mary had a little lamb one. The Mary had a little lamb one. Oh, that one is short. I finished that one. But for a number of the examples, what happens is I work through part of it and then I leave the rest of it and say, hey, finish this. So I get it started for you, show you how to do the first half of the song and show you exactly how I harmonized it. And then I'm like, OK, now you finish this. And there are some additional exercises in there, um, you know, that aren't just where I didn't start it for you and I just give you something and say, hey, go through this and, and finish it. And I'm actually going to be adding more of those this weekend, um, more of the examples that, you know, I don't start it for you. Basically, these songs, there's Mary Had a Little Lamb, there's Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, there's 
I called it Danny Boy because that's how we, most of us know it. But the traditional name of the original tune was Londonderry Air. So uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb, Londonderry Air. Uh, what else did I use? Um, I use Oh Susanna in there. I use Shenandoah in there. I use uh, well-known either... Well, American pop, American folk songs or the London Dairy Air is uh, um, what Irish, right? Um, yeah, I always used to think Scottish because it talks about pipes, and I think of Scottish pipes, but no, it's Irish. Um, so uh, I would also love it if some people could make recommendations of other songs, maybe from other countries, you know, French folk songs and German folk songs and so forth, in which I could maybe uh, do a, more demonstrations and uh, put them up as homework assignments. So, um, so yeah, I go through for, for the demonstrations that I have, I go through part of it and then I'm like, okay, now you're it's on your own to finish this thing. And then I provide a place on MuseScore.com where if you've done it in MuseScore, you can upload it there and then we can discuss it. So I'm really hoping that students will do that. People will take the course and upload their stuff and then comment on each other's work. And I can be dropping in also and commenting on things. I don't have a well, I do have a, a planned thing also in which I will definitely take certain pieces and give my personal feedback on them as part of this other thing I do, the Music Master Class, which I, I mentioned this is technically like a joint venture between the, um, you know, my Music Master Class and this Harmony course. Uh, so once, once you're underway with the Harmony course, we can talk about whether you want to also do the master class. And that's like a way of participating where when you, once you upload stuff, I am going to see it and respond to it because it's a smaller group of people um, actually uploading uh, stuff specifically uh, for this kind of feedback. Um, but just by uploading it to MuseScore.com, uh, and I have those links in the course also, uh, here community right at the very beginning is where I have a link to where you can go to the group on MuseScore.com or if you're not really comfortable with MuseScore you can just go to the Facebook group that I created also I just created this like yesterday so probably no one knows about it yet but uh, either of those places or just the comments on the lessons like within the lessons there's an area for comments and you can upload an image there so if you've done something paper and pencil uh, you could you know take a picture of it and then upload that image. It's a little harder to deal with compared to MuseScore.com. The nice thing with MuseScore.com is once you upload a score there, we can play it, you know, and that's kind of nice. Um, so it's really nice for being able to comment on things. But all of those are resources that I'm providing, places where you can like upload your work. I want to check out that Facebook group for a second and see. Um, oh, one person wants to join. So I guess I need to uh, let that person in, shall we? There we go. Um, I didn't remember that I had created it out where I had to approve them. <clears throat> so anyhow, there's places where you will be, will be able to upload, you know, whether it's a PDF or a video or whatever, and get comments from other students. And boy, do I really want that. I really want to create this uh, sort of community uh, sense where uh, you share your work, but you comment on other people's work and really kind of learn together. I don't have like an organized cohort of people going through together, but you know, it, uh, I could do that at some point if there's enough interest. So, um, oh yeah, Alouette and Farajaka. So Alouette is a good, uh, um, Alouette is especially good example. I actually tried thinking about doing it with Farajaka. Um, a, a complication with taking a melody that's well known as a round as Farajaka is, it's really a two measure harmonic pattern that repeats over and over and over again. And so it becomes hard to do much with it <laughs> uh, because it, it's got to keep coming back to the same place. Um, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. It might, it might destroy its ability to work as a round. Um, but yeah, those are good suggestions and I should absolutely uh, actually, think, especially Alouette, that's a great example. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Okay, so I've been uh, I've been talking here for like an hour, and uh, you know I didn't have a specific amount of time, but that's like you know a good amount of time. But if there are further questions that I can be answering for people while we're all here, I'm happy to do so. I will just point out again that at the very top of the chat is where I posted the uh, link to where you can get all the information and enroll and all that, um, and it already has built in this uh, twenty dollar discount that is good 
through tomorrow. So, you know, if you want, if, if you want to have that applied, that's your incentive to, to do it soon, but I'm not going to like close the course. Some people do that. They'll have an, an online course. They only open for a little while to try to like herd everyone in at a particular moment. And no, I'd rather just make it available whenever people want. Um, so yeah, you will be able to sign up for this course anytime. And I'm sure there will be specials. I'll probably do a Black Friday special and et cetera. But uh, you know, now <laughs> between now and tomorrow is a really good time to sign up, is what I would say. So again, uh any other questions that I can answer about the course, about uh music, about uh, the stuff I've been talking about? Well, uh, while I wait for to see if anything else comes in, I will just again, um, uh, yeah, yeah, rock on enough. Yeah, that just breaks me. I didn't. It's funny because I, I I do a demonstration on it, and it and I I was in I was in this mode of doing a demonstration. It's just between me and my computer, but I don't know somehow talking to people and having this community aspect to it, and knowing. I don't know. Being around people brings out an emotional side. Um, especially in these times when being around people is like this whole weird thing of like, you know, we can only connect this way or, you know, I don't teach in-person classes right now so much. Um, anyhow, uh, yeah, so music is powerful. Being able to connect is powerful. Having facilities like this is powerful. So I definitely hope anyone who's interested just checks it out, takes it really seriously and would love to have you join us. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for um, being here. Yeah, All By Myself is the uh, um, pop song that, that uh, uh, you know, -da 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 -da. Uh, when I was a boy or something like that, I never needed anyone. Right, that's how that, and it's totally based on that rock on and off piece. Absolutely. Um, oh, by the way, you may notice I'm not a singer, but I do, I, I do enjoy singing, I enjoy talking about the relationship, you know, ear training and how all these things have sounds associated with them, the, the theoretical concepts. And I like demonstrating things with my voice. So <laughs> you will see that in, in the course, I will be constantly singing lines to talk about things. So anyhow, I don't wanna take any more of your time. And I, I just wanna thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your interest in this. And, um, and I will be hopefully, Hopefully uh, seeing you in your comments in the course and the, the music that you upload. And I really look forward to uh, seeing what you all are able to create with this. So again, thank you so much.